Hey everybody, it's Eric Torenberg, co-founder, partner of Village Global, a network-driven venture firm. And this is Venture Stories, a podcast covering topics relating to tech and business with world-leading experts. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Venture Stories by Village Global. I'm here today with a very special guest, Nicholas Collin, co-founder of The Family in Paris, as well as author of the book, Hedge. Nicholas, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's great to be with you. Uh, Nicholas, you just came out with the book, uh, The Hedge, uh, last year. Uh, Why did you write Hedge, and and what's the big idea that you're trying to introduce to the world? So yes, just a bit of background. So I was trained in computer science a long time ago during the dot-com bubble in the 90s. And when I ended up uh, ready to arrive on the labor market, it was right after the bubble had burst. It so happens that many of my classmates and myself decided that with the bubble finished and startups basically having disappeared uh, off the map, we were not interested in computer science anymore. And so we all switched to either business schools or for me, uh, public administration. And so I spent 10 years after that studying public administration and then working for the French government. And when I finally came back into technology, that was a bit more than 10 years ago, it was with this background in government and public policy that I've been using a lot ever since as a tech, first as an entrepreneur and then uh, as a venture capitalist. And that's because tech more and more collides with policy and regulations and um, the backlash and, and stuff like that. And so my big idea... Uh, because my background is mixed between government and technology, is that I think we should expect more change from tech companies today than from governments. And very few people realize that. And And I've been spending most of my time over the last 10 years explaining to people that don't know much about technology that actually those entrepreneurs harnessing the power of technology and deploying those large platforms that gather literally hundreds of millions of users are the ones that have the power to solve many problems that were too long without a solution. And we should expect more from them and probably less from governments. Uh, why was this different in, in the past? What's changed to make it the way, the way it is now? What's the evidence uh, for that? And, and what does that mean going forward? So that's a good question. Um, I, I think there are two two reasons why it it is so today. Uh, One reason is that, so there's this uh, Venezuelan um, uh, slash British economist called Carlota Perez, who's widely read actually in the VC community, especially in the US, because she wrote that book in 2002 called Technological Revolutions and Financial Capital. And in that book, she introduces a framework that is very compelling, which basically divides every technological revolution in two different phases. So the first phase is what she calls the installation phase. uh, And that is the the decades during which like entrepreneurs and investors are busy trying new things and trying to solve problems and discovering new models. And then comes the second phase, which is the deployment phase, uh, during which governments take over and and set up new institutions that are here to mitigate the adverse consequences of the new technology of the day. And so I think today we'll still, and Carlota also thinks that we're still in the installation phase, that is the phase during which we'll, we have still a lot to discover and the best approach to discovering new things is entrepreneurship. And so instead of trying to rush to regulating the digital economy and coming up with uh, what are usually wrong ideas as to how we should regulate that economy, we should still be listening and observing entrepreneurs as they try to solve problems and as they discover new models that are made possible by technology and that weren't possible in the past. And so one reason why tech people are more effective at solving our problems than governments is because we're still in the in- installation phase. We, we, haven't, we haven't reached yet that second phase deployment when governments uh, supposedly become relevant again. But there's another reason uh, why I think tech people could 
be more relevant the governance than governments for a longer time than what used to be the norm. And it's the fact that today technology, so we have that word technology that is a bit abstract. We don't really know what's behind it. But if you dig a bit deeper, you realize that technology, when, when people talk about technology, they're mostly talking about two sets of technology uh, that are on one side computing and on the other side networks. And if you combine the two computing and networks, you end up with what exists today, that is large tech companies that invite billions of users to use the same application at the same time. And, and that creates things that weren't possible in the past. So computing and network, what networks makes, poss- makes something possible that wasn't possible in the past. It's that you can deliver high quality and a customized experience at a very large scale. And in the past, if you wanted to solve problems that individuals were confronted with, you had to tailor solutions for each individual at a very small scale. And if you try to scale up, you ended up like trapped in the dilemma between tailoring solutions for individuals and uh, reaching scale. And, and, and this is why governments were relevant. It's because beyond a certain scale, the private companies couldn't deliver um, solutions or products to, to dozens of millions of people that, are, that were somehow confronted with the same problem. And so governments took charge at that point because they, they said, okay, so you private businesses have tried to solve those problems. We've managed to do it up to a certain scale, but then you, you've reached that point of exhaustion uh, beyond which I, the government, will issue mandates and regulations and uh, raise taxes and, 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 and with the power of that mighty large organization that is a government, will solve that problem and not at a small scale, but at the scale of an entire nation. Yeah. So scale uh, at that time was very difficult. And I think that is not true today anymore. And uh, because today, with compute, when you combine technology, uh, computing and networks, you can scale solutions up to a very large scale while retaining the capacity, the ability to tailor uh, your products to the particular needs of every individual. And so entrepreneurs, as opposed to what existed in the, 20th, in the 20th century, have the capacity to deploy their model at a very large scale without the need for governments to intervene and to, and to take charge. Looking back a little bit at the Carlito Perez book, why was that so game changing or transformational or like what, what were the, what was the you know, key paradigm before uh, her, her ideas came out and uh, how did that change things following? So I, I think her influence can, has, can be um, explained by the fact that her book, so she got, she initially got interested in technological revolutions and financial bubbles because she used to be working on energy. And so she was interested as to, uh, in why does the price of oil fluctuate so much with the booms and bursts and ups and downs and so on. So she started to get interested in financial bubbles um, as a comparable for the, 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 the oil industry. And then she realized that there were those patterns in history with financial bubbles happening every time a new technology was made available for entrepreneurs. And so she studied past history, uh, what what had happened uh, ever since the Industrial Revolution at the end of the 18th century, and discovered that there was indeed a pattern, that is, every time a new technology with a game-changing potential uh, is made available to entrepreneurs, it inevitably leads to a financial bubble that then bursts. And then after the bubble bursting, real things happen. That's 
only with the bubble bust that you can, you know, relax a little bit, uh, reflect uh, on what has just happened, draw lessons from the many failures that uh, people have experienced during the bubble, and then start again, but on, on firmer ground. And so she wrote her book on that topic, documented uh, the, the fact that it had indeed happen, happened uh, five times since the Industrial Revolution. And it was published in 2002. And so that was two years after the Nasdaq bubble had burst. And so at that time, the venture capital, so the people that were, that had decided to stay in the venture capital business, even though there was, there were no startups to invest in anymore, they were completely depressed and uncertain as to did they still have a job, uh, their ability to raise new funds, etc. And so they read this book that said, well, that's normal. The bubble has burst, but then things will start, the music will start again, and you'll be able to make great investments in companies that will go way beyond what was achieved during the bubble. And so those VCs read that book, uh, among them Fred Wilson of Union Square Ventures, and they were reassured, certain that that's not because the bubble has just burst, that there's no business for us anymore. Quite the opposite, actually. We, we need to raise funds now because there are many new companies coming and those companies will be, be busy discovering new business models in a context in which we understand things much better than 10 years ago. So I think that's really the game-changing impact of Carlotta's work. It's that she made it so clear that the dot-com bubble bursting in 2000 was not the end of the story. Actually, it was more of the beginning of the story. And so she inspired hope and, and invited all those forward-looking people in, into the VC business. And, and now or we're, we're almost 20 years later and we can realize that, in fact, it was just the beginning because since then... Uh, so many things have happened, uh, among them Facebook, Uber, Uber, uh, BND, uh, ch- uh, technology in China, and many other things. And in 40 years from now, do you think her ideas will have as much or even more staying power? Or do you think there will be a, a paradigm that, that replaces it? No, uh, actually, uh, w- what Carlotta calls a techno-economic paradigm, it's something that lasts for decades. Like, you can expect the, the current paradigm, that of computing and networks, to last for maybe 70 or 80 years. There are so many industries in which uh, computing and networks have yet to be deployed to solve problems that we know can be solved, but because those industries are still reluctant to use uh, this new technology, well, we, we can't solve those those problems yet. And it remains to be seen... Uh, who are the entrepreneurs that will finally make the break um, breakthrough in, in these industries? Uh, it remains to be seen which nation will lead the pack at the global level. Uh, maybe it's the US, maybe it's China, but there are s- still many opportunities to be seized for entrepreneurs and investors uh, in, in this current paradigm. And so I think and that's a message I'm using uh, and voicing a lot in Europe, I think we should be focused on seizing those opportunities that exist today rather than trying to prepare the next paradigm because it's too early for that. And how do you sort of divide the, the paradigms looking back in history? Like what, what was the one before, before this one and, and who was the Carlo, Carlo de Perez of, the, of that paradigm? Or what was it? So, uh, yes, as I, as I mentioned, so I, I'm really a Carlo de student in, in these matters, but as I mentioned, she divides our history how uh, 250 years since the Industrial Revolution into five different periods, each corresponding to a given paradigm. So the first one was the Industrial Revolution itself, which brought about the radically new idea that if you combine labor and capital into factories, then you can generate something that was mostly unknown at the time, which is productivity gains. And so that gave birth most uh, first to the textile industry in the area of Manchester in the UK. And then um, it, it expanded from there. 
the next revolution was railways or railroads. Uh, and it was a revolution because if you deployed rail railways, then you, uh, that contributed to radically changing the geography the, of our economy. Suddenly, distances didn't matter as much. You could store products far away from, from consumers and have um, and use those trains uh, and railways to move around uh, goods, people, and uh, and that radically changed the economy. And during that paradigm, it was again Britain that led the pack. And then the next paradigm uh, happened at the end of the 19th century. It was the steel industry. And so with the discovery that you could produce steel in, a, in an efficient and an expensive way, it made it possible to build like large bridges and many other things that uh, completely changed the shape of the economy. And, and at that point, Britain was not in the race anymore because... The British were mostly uninterested in investing in the new steel industry. And so there was a race triggered between the US and Germany, which were the two leading uh, nations when it came to building steel empires. And the US mostly won that race because it gave, gave birth to US steel and the, and the Carnegie Empire at, uh, at the end of the 19th century. And then the next revolution happened with the invention of the automobile. And again, the automobile uh, was a race between Germany and the US because the, auto the actual first automobile was invented in Germany. But uh, the US invented something else, which, uh, which was the car industry. That It was not enough to have the, the, the actual technology. You needed to turn that technology into a, a prosperous industry. And that was the gift of Henry Ford and, and later Alfred Sloan and G GM. And that happened in the region of Detroit. And that gave birth to an, a radically new way of life, which is that if you can, if everyone can purchase an automobile, then suddenly you don't need to live in cities anymore. You can move out of the city. You can buy suburban house. And you can, uh, instead of shopping in the shops in the city, you can shop in a shopping mall that is in suburban areas. And so the entire way of life in which we, we've all grown was invented thanks to the automobile being the new things and the entire society being reorganized around the automobile. And that happened in the US because the US, for many reasons, was the nation in which it was easier to build that, that industry that completely redefined what the economy was about during the 20th century. And then uh, the competing nations like Germany and others were completely wiped out by World War I and then World War II, and which made it possible for the U.S. to race ahead and to come to the risk rescue of Europe. And so we've, we've all been shaped and influenced by this paradigm because that was the entire 20th uh, century. It was uh, the, the date of birth of that paradigm, according to Carlotta, was the launch of the 4T model in 1908. And the end of that paradigm was really the financial crisis like 11 years ago. And so that was exactly one century after that. So it lasted an, um, an entire century. And because most of us have grown in that uh, during the 20th century, we've been influenced by the idea that that is how things are and we should expect to things to be like that forever but that's not true because now that paradigm doesn't exist anymore a new paradigm has been has been born thanks to the invention of the new technology com uh, new technologies computing and networks and now we're realizing that everything is going is going to change in every dimension of our economy that is every industry, but also many things that we took for granted, like uh, the welfare states, uh, labor law, unions, uh, what production is about, what consumption is about, what work is about, democracy itself. Everything will be reshaped by the new paradigm. And the crisis we're going through at the moment, which is both economic and social and political, can be explained by all the pain and suffering that this transition brings about.
let, let's get into that transition. So in, in the book, you, 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 you talk about the difference between the social safety net 1.0 and, and what we need for social safety net 2.0. Uh, talk about that. What was 1.0 and, and what do we need for 2.0 and how do we get it? So yes, so again, my background is policy. And, uh, uh, and when I worked for the French government, I was uh, quite involved in uh, studying social policy. So how do, you, how do we deliver economic security to households by deploying programs such as social insurance program and, and uh, access to capital and stuff like that? What's interesting if you study that at a global level is that you realize that every developed nation on earth uh, at some point during the 20th century has put in place a, a complex nexus of institutions that together perform key functions to the benefit of both households and businesses. Uh, the three functions that were performed by what I call the social safety net 1.0 were, first, you need to cover people against risks. If you have a critical problem, like you, you're you sick, and so you need to stop working and you need proper care, then you have a health insurance that's here to, to, to cover that risk. Uh, if you lose your job, you have an unemployment insurance that here that's here to provide you with benefits until you find a new job. If you're too old and you don't have the strength and stamina to work anymore, then you get a pension. And so that's the first function. It's covering you against risks that we know will happen at some point and that are too impactful for any private insurance to cover. And so every country designed its own system or every developed country design its own system. So the systems are different from the US to the UK to France to Germany, etc. But from a systemic point of view, the function that's performed is covering people against risks. The second function is providing people with access to capital. There are many points in life when you need more money that you can earn uh, with your current job. Uh, especially in the Fordist paradigm of the 20th century, so that of the automobile and mass production, there were two times in your life where you really needed more money that you can earn. Uh, the first one was when you needed to buy a car. A uh, car was too expensive for most wage workers to, to buy in cash. You needed to go to the bank and uh, borrow money to buy your car. And then the other uh, thing was you needed to buy a house at some point because owning a house was a key part of economic security. It, it, was, it was about owning your own capital when you get old and then you don't have to pay rent anymore, etc. And so, um, but a house, so that explains to you the, the contribution of governments to the whole thing. Buying a house is so expensive. It's so beyond what you earned under the form of a wage uh, of a salary that you really need to go to the bank and borrow money that you will pay back over the course of 20 or even 30 or 40 years. And which bank is crazy enough to lend some random individual the money to buy a house? Well, actually, no banker is crazy enough to do that unless they're backed by the government. And the government is here to secure the loan and to provide bankers with the certainty that if something goes wrong, goes wrong, then we'll be here to help you rebound. And that's why um, during the New Deal in the 1930s, the Roosevelt administration founded uh, what became Fannie Mae. Uh, it has it had a different name at the point, but uh, at that point, but Fannie Mae is the government-sponsored institution that is here to secure the bank as they lend all that money to so many households so that those households can buy houses, which are extremely expensive. And so that's the second function of the social safety net 1.0. It's providing, providing you the money you need to buy your car or buy your house, which are two key assets that you couldn't really live with without during the 20th century. And the third function is helping you organize, uh, well, connect with uh, fellow individuals and defend your interests collectively. And 
So in the past, that was trade unions, workers' unions, especially for factory workers. And that's because the economy is constant, constantly changing. It's evolving. Technological breakthroughs, the booms and bursts of, at the macroeconomic level, other countries catching up in terms of development. And so you, you need to, to compete with them. And so because there are constant changes in the economy, you need to revisit the social contract frequently. So how do you do that? To, to make sure that the uh, social contract is revisited in, in everybody's interest rather than only in the interest of the powerful, you need bargaining power. You need the different parties to bargain together and to come up with a, an accept, with a solution that is acceptable for everyone. And so in the 1930s, basically the governments all over the world realized that we need to support those workers as they try to organize and, and provide them with bargaining powers, power so, so that they can defend their interests against employers. And so that's the third function. Uh, it's about supporting individual efforts as people try to organize and defend their interests in, a, in, a, in an economy that's constant, constantly changing. So altogether, those institutions, so social insurance systems, Fannie Mae, and um, assistance for trade unions by the government, constituted uh, what I call the social safety net 1.0. It was different institutions brought together social institutions, financial institutions, and trade unions that together made it possible for workers that had very shitty jobs at the beginning of the 20th century to gradually improve the quality of those jobs so that today we remember factory jobs as the best jobs anyone can have. Because those jobs in the 1950s and 60s came with high wages, benefits, dignity, security, and um, a sense of belonging to a community of fellow workers organized by trade unions. And this is the nostalgia that many people uh, feel today. They remember those jobs that were that were hard jobs, like you needed to work hard and it was not very rewarding because it was routine. You, need to, you needed to tighten those bolts on assembly, line, on assembly lines all day long. But those jobs came with dignity, stability, security, benefits, high wages, uh, strong unions. And so people were quite content with them. And that was the byproduct of the social safety net 1.0. 1.0. And we don't have that anymore today for one simple reason is that today's jobs are very different from the jobs that existed at the time. And so what we need to do, because we're in, we, we're in a different paradigm, is to reinvent the entire social safety net so that it performs again the three functions that are critical to providing people with economic security. You need to cover people against risks. You need to provide them with access to capital and you need to help them organize together so that they defend their interests. But again, it's not about factory workers in the car industry anymore. Today, it's about very different jobs in a very different economy and that calls for very different institu institutions. And, and so uh, outline more about those, those, those institutions, what they look like and, and how, how we get there and how they bring the three things you mentioned, as well as what you mentioned earlier about you know, dignity, stability, and, and a sense of belonging? So um, it's a great question, but it's, it's, it's also difficult to answer because it's exactly like in startups. Like you need to explore and try many things and come up with uh, and fail many times before you finally discover what, what works. And so you need several generations of political or social entrepreneurs trying new things before we finally come up with the solution that works. And if you try to rush forward and, and try to draw those solutions on a napkin, then it's very satisfying and rewarding intellectually, but uh, translating that into actually delivering stability and dignity to people, uh, well, there's still a long way to go. But I can provide some ideas. So the first idea, it, is that when it comes to covering risks, 
uh, we need to realize that the risks of today are might be different from the risks that workers will, were confronted with uh, in the 1950s and 1960s. There are risks that are the same, like we all get sick, uh, it's not over, we, uh, and so we still need health insurance. But there are new risks, uh, and one risk that I think will become more and more important in the future is the risk that you can't afford housing in the urban areas where most opportunities and jobs waiting for you are concentrated. And so you're, uh, I'm not sure if you're in, in California these, these days, but uh, San Francisco and the entire Bay Area is, a, is, an, is an illustration of, uh, of that phenomenon. The fact that the digital economy, and it's a paradox, is, cluster, is concentrating people and jobs and economic activities in cities which means that we're confronted with something, with a risk that didn't exist during the, 40s, uh, during the 20th century. Remember, the 20th century was all about owning cars, which made it possible to live in suburban areas. But today, there are no jobs left in suburban areas. If you want to find a job, you need to, uh, if, if you're high skill, you, you, you can become an engineer, but it will be in the city. And if you're low skill, or what we call low skill, which is uh, not the best term, but you can find a service job, but it's also in the city. You, you can become a teacher, you can become a child carer, you can become a nurse, you can become a barista, you can wait tables, you can clean floors, you can drive uh, people around on Uber, on Lyft, but that's all in the city. And so if you want to take that job, uh, seize that opportunity that's waiting for you, you need to leave either in the city or not far away. And that's not possible today because the, the rents are so high and, and housing has become so un unaffordable that you're, conf you're effectively confronted with that risk of not being able to afford housing where there's a job waiting for you. And so I think that's typically the new risk, a new risk that, that's brought about by the transition. And we need to figure out how policy, how governments and the public sector together can help people by covering that risk like helping people find housing where there are jobs for them that's that calls for an, an entirely different conception of the housing market uh, a radically different approach uh, at regulating uh, the housing market uh, maybe a new tax system i don't know there are many ideas out there but I think this is the major risk that didn't, didn't exist in the past and that exists today and that we need to cover if we want people to be able to seize uh, opportunities. Access to capital is, an, is another uh, thing. So today, you can't really say that owning a car is as critical as, is, as it used to be in the past. You don't really need a car because the economy is more and more urban. And if you are part of an urban economy, that means that you can use public transit or you can use Uber or Lyft, or you can share rides, etc. And so owning a car is not that critical as it used to be in the past. So there are still many banks ready to lend you the money to buy a car, but it's not a need that you're confronted with uh, in today's economy. There's another need, however, that, that you're confronted with if you're part of this new economy, and that's the need of being more entrepreneurial when it comes to your career. What the digital age is about is it's an economy that's more entrepreneurial in the sense of corporations are not as strong as they used to be. And you, basically your employer would only survive over the long term if they're entrepreneurial enough to reinvent themselves many times. And so that for workers, that means that you have two options. If either you work for an employer that is entrepreneurial enough, which means that you can count on your employer to innovate and to explore new markets and to launch new products. And so that means that your employer will still be here next year, two years from now, in five years, in 10 years, because they have that, that entrepreneurial spirit that makes all the difference. But as a worker, as an employee, 
you need to reinvent yourself as often as your employer does. Uh, if your employer innovates, that means that maybe they don't need your, your skills anymore and you need to retrain if you want to remain in place uh, in this organization. So that's the first option. The other option is that you work for an employer that's not entrepreneurial. Uh, and, and then it's even worse because at some point, because they're not entrepreneurial enough, the company that employs you will go bust and disappear and you lose your job. And so you see that in both cases, you need to be extremely mobile and flexible as a worker, either because you need to reinvent yourself if you want to stay with the same employer or because you need to reinvent yourself because you lose your job because your employer will have gone bust. And so that means that there, there's something that was not as frequent in the past that will become very frequent in the future. That is, the need to switch. You need to switch, leave your current job, pick a new industry, learn new skills, try your hand at, some, at something new, see if, it, if you like it. And if you like it, then dig deeper and make your place in that new industry. But today, if you go to a banker, to a bank, and say, well, you know, I kind of feel that my current employer will go bust in six months. So I'd like to quit now. And I'd like to take time for myself and talk to many people and learn, learn new skills and maybe move to another city and have my spouse go with me and find a new school for my kids. And I need money to cover, to cover the cost of all that. That is the loss of revenue, the cost of learning new skills, the cost of moving to another city, and the cost of my spouse leaving their job and finding a new job in this new city. The, no bank will lend you money for that because there's no collateral in the current system. So why, won't, why would bank lend you money to buy a car but not to acquire new skills and move to a new city where there are many jobs waiting for you. That's absurd in many ways, but that can be explained by the fact that we don't have a funny May to secure the banks when it comes to lending money to people who want to switch jobs. And that's something that needs to be invented today. We need to provide the conditions so that the financial system lends money to people to help them be as entrepreneurial in their career as corporations need to be entrepreneurial to survive. Yeah. Is there a little bit more of the individual being treated as a corporation a little bit or, or you know, or, or less corporation, more sort of corporate individuals in some sense? Well, in the Fordist paradigm, so in the 20th century, the nature of the Fordist corporation was that it was extremely resilient because it, scientific management made the corporation extremely resistant to anything that uh, that came with the uh, with all the booms and busts of the macroeconomic cycle today it's not true anymore like you can have large tech companies so today's tech companies are the equivalent of yesterday's car manufacturers and so a car manufacturer in the past was couldn't die like it was so large and so well capitalized and and they owned so many assets and they had a grip on the market you, you couldn't kill those companies today uh, the dominant companies of the day are tech companies and we have many many examples that suggest that it's not because you're large that you will never die that even the largest companies are constantly in danger of becoming irrelevant and of being wiped off the map, like Yahoo or, uh, or many others. Uh, and so we need to realize that the corporation is not a buffer anymore. It's not, it doesn't um, hedge you against the adverse consequences of instability in the global economy. And so as individuals for the first time in decades were, were exposed to the, the widespread instability that exists in the, in the economy. And we need to take care of that by ourselves. We cannot count on our employers anymore to, to, to protect us when things go bad. And I think that's a radical change in terms of how we design our institutions. 
uh, we need to be less reliant on, on our employers because our employers need to be entrepreneurial if they want to survive. And we know for a fact that many of them will not be entrepreneurial enough and will disappear at some, at some point. There's this um, maybe difference of opinion between Eric Weinstein and Naval where Eric sort of says, hey, you know, we're not necessarily wired uh, for all this sort of inherent stability of the idea of everyone being entrepreneurial, or everyone being entrepreneur, and we're certainly not educated, you know, uh, culturally ingrained in, in that idea. Whereas Naval says we're going back to our natural wiring, which is for everyone to be an entrepreneur, and that and that's great news. Uh, how do you think about that? So uh, the, the term I've um, uh, I've chosen to describe this new age, this new paradigm, is the entrepreneurial age. Uh, I, I've been borrowing that term from Babak Nivi, who one, who's one of the co-founders of Angel List, because he wrote like uh, six years ago, he wrote a, a, a very inspiring article called "The Entrepreneurial Age," and he explains that now it's all all about entrepreneurship. Companies will win or lose based on their ability to be entrepreneurial. That's the key message here. So the entrepreneurial age for me is not an age in which we all become entrepreneurs. Uh, the idea that, you know, wage work is over and salaried workers are, will disappear and will all become self-employed working in the gig economy is not true, I think. I think in the, in the future, most of us will still be salaried by large organizations. But the nature of wage work, wage work will be very different from what it was in the past. In, in, to the extent of not being synonymous with, the, with stability and long-term economic security anymore. In the past, if you joined a company as an employee, you could expect to stay there for 10 years without having to learn new skills. And you could even expect to move up the ranks and earn more money every year than the previous year. Um, that's that was the expectation of most workers as they entered the labor market in the Fordist paradigm. Today, um, it's not true anymore. Uh, it does again. It doesn't mean that you have to become an entrepreneur or self-employed worker. It means that you can't expect your career to move up simply by joining an organization. You need to take charge when it comes to moving up or switching to a new industry or learning new skills or exploring new, new activities. And that is what, means to be, what it means to be entrepreneurial as a worker. Again, it's not founding your own company or becoming a freelancer. It's about uh, being ready to be on the hunt rather than settling in your current situation and expecting things to improve over time. And so uh, you're right uh, when you say that it's not the mindset that most workers have today. Like you, you don't want to be bothered with constantly plodding for the next move, etc. We have so many things to deal with in our life that if you add that, it's, it's a bit too much for many people. But... Uh, the fact that the mindset is not here reflects uh, different things, I think. First of all, the winners of, to of yesterday might be the losers of tomorrow. Like There are many people that have that entrepreneurial mindset today, but they were not rewarded by the system in the previous paradigm. Like If you were a large organization, you would prefer docile, employees that didn't really speak up or took initiatives because initiatives were disrupting the order of scientific management. And so those uh, workers that had the, this entrepreneurial mindset usually remained on the fringe of the system. And today, because uh, the economy is becoming more entrepreneurial, suddenly you can invite them at the center of the system. And those who have more of a settling mindset will be cast out and will have to deal uh, at the fringe of the system. So that's the first thing. Uh, the other thing is that there's probably something that we need to 
change in our education system because our entire education system has been designed so that to, so as to prepare workers for settling in a position uh, being employed by a corporation that would remain their employer for years without them having to reskill and so we need to reflect on what exactly do we teach children to prepare them for that world in which they really need to be more entrepreneurial in their work experience and the third thing is that you're not on your own being entrepreneurial doesn't mean that you're alone in a jungle jungle having to fight with every uh, all the others you can be entrepreneurial as a community of workers you can connect to other workers that are as entrepreneurial as you and share tips and opportunities and help each other and support each other and teach each other to to make sure that everyone having as many opportunities as possible and this i think is the direction we should go in if we want to discover what the trade unions of the future will be in the past trade unions were designed to defend workers where they were like you were employed in a factory and your union was here to make sure that your wage would go up uh, your working conditions would be acceptable and uh, the occasional conflict with management would be settled in a fair way uh, tomorrow i think Uh, unions will be designed so as to help workers be more entrepreneurial like uh, and so the example I, I, i'd like to use is so a few years back before trump's election and all the discussions about coal mining in west virginia there were a series of articles based on inspired by uh, research by economists about the fact that maybe those coal miners who are losing losing their job in the coal mines of west virginia could be retrained to become solo panels solo panel installers because there's a shortage uh, on the labor market for solo panel like we need more people installing solo panel on roofs and there are people losing their job in coal mines so and you connect the two well you get the the coal miners and you retrain them so that they become solo panel installers the problem is that uh, you need money to to pay for that training and also you need those people to move to leave west virginia to and settle in arizona where where most solar panels are installed these days um imagine if a union took charge of that like the union would come to talk to the management of the coal mine and say well you know you we, we know you're you're about to fire most of us and the the pay is too low anyway and the conditions are terrible and so we demand that you increase the pay and you improve the conditions and if you don't do that well here's the news we've all been training together to become solo panel installers most of us are ready to leave and settle in, in Arizona and so that's the deal either you sign for better conditions today or we all live together and move to Arizona as a as a group if you have this scenario in mind it's a bit far fetched but you realize that unions are not doing that these days they don't help workers flee industries that are going down to join industries that are going up because most unions are trapped within one industry or even one company and their horizon doesn't extend beyond that but to tomorrow i think that computing and networks will make it so easy for workers to connect together as a network and to help each other spot new opportunities uh, feel the danger that an industry is going down prepare for the worst learn new skills support each other when it comes to moving to a new city uh, be reassured as to what it, uh, what you can expect in a new industry and that is how you can be more entrepreneurial not as a lone individual but as a community of workers We talked a bit about stability. Can you talk about what dignity uh, will look like and what a belonging will will look like? I, I've explored a little bit how you know markets make us more independent and less uh, and thus less dependent on others, uh, mm-hmm. and sort of naturally uh, is disruptive to to communities. So how do we you know still have this sense of economic growth and innovation 
while also maintaining or, or perhaps thinking of you know belonging in, in new and in, in dignity in new ways i'm not really worried about the sense of belonging because what what, what the digital age brings about is a, an ext- an unprecedented ability to connect people together so what we've seen recently is that people don't like to be connected at the scale of an entire nation but they like to be connected at the scale of a small online community in in which people are confronted with similar problems or share the same political opinions or are interested in the same topics and i think that we've we've seen a lot of contexts in which network technology makes it possible for people to gather together to 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 form a network around something the problem is that we there have not been many opportunities for people to explore uh, using that technology to connect workers confronted with problems related to la- to, to the labor market but I think it's coming. Uh, you, you, we already have many examples of uh, people that learn new skills together and that stay connected over time, like alumni of a university, except it's not a university. It's, uh, those are skills that you can learn online, etc. I think that, again, that's what the internet is about. You, uh, you're not alone. You, you can be connected to many people who, share, who have something to share with you, who are aligned in their interests or are confronted with the same problems. And so I, I think that it's still too early. So pe- people don't really realize that you can recreate a sense of belonging using those tools. But I think at some point we'll see communities emerge using those tools and relying on connectivity rather than a physical proximity to have a sense of a shared uh, interest. Uh, so um, to illustrate that, th- there have been a lot of discussions like why are unions strong in factories and not strong or even inexistent in uh, retail, for instance. And the reason is that factory workers are among themselves all day long. They're all along the assembly line. They're in a the shared space and they don't interact within anyone from the outside. And so they can dedicate the entire time interacting with each other. And that creates strong um, relationships that then can be converted into organizing and building a union and bargaining with management. On the other hand, if you have a look at retail, retail workers are scattered across different shops different locations. So you might work uh, uh, at McDonald's, but you don't know everyone that's working at McDonald's because you know your colleagues in in this particular restaurant, but you don't know people working at other restaurants. Also, uh, retail workers are constantly interacting not with each other, but mostly with customers. Like you have the customers interacting the discussion you're having with your fellow workers, which is normal. You have to serve the customer. That's what retail is about. And so you don't have as much as many opportunities to connect and to build a relationship with your fellow workers, which um, make people more isolated and less prone to organizing and building unions. I think uh, that can be consump- compensated for by technology. So you might not have as much time to interact with your fellow workers while you're busy at a, at the restaurant serving customers, but maybe technology can create other opportunities to connect with your fellow workers in this particular restaurant or in other restaurant restaurants, and then that will create the context for you to realize that you're confronted with the same problems, that that maybe you could take collective action. And that will inspire a sense of belonging to a community that doesn't exist today, that is, workers in the retail industry. What about dignity? Where do, uh, how do we instill it and, and what might that look like? That, that's a good question. So 
I think in the past, so in the 20th century, you can basically divide uh, the labor market between two different categories of jobs. On one side are the bad jobs, uh, are the good jobs, and on the other side are the bad jobs, those that no one wants. What makes a good job? A good job comes, it's not only a task that you perform in exchange for money. It's something that comes with many other things. It comes with being covered against risks, that is social benefits. It comes with access to capital. The fact that you have this job means that you can go to the bank and borrow money to buy a house or a car. And it comes with the ability to organize uh, with your fellow workers. And so the good jobs in the past were those in which you had all of that. And most of those jobs were located in manufacturing industries. Again, that's because those industries were the ones for which those institutions of the safety net 1.0 were designed. Plus, it was easier to organize in factories than in other parts of the economy. And so today, you, you know, you have uh, many people explain that, you know, uh, voters in the Rust Belt voted for Trump because they're fed up with all those jobs disappearing and they want to go back to a time in which most jobs were good jobs because those were jobs in manufacturing. And a job with manufacturing, again, came with high wages, good benefits, a strong union, etc. And that was synony- that is what inspired the sense of dignity because the job might be boring in itself. Like I'm working on an assembly line. Who wants that? But because this job comes with a good wage, high benefits, a union, uh, it also comes with some kind of a pride. Like I'm, pride to, I'm proud to be part of that community of workers that are, that are rewarded with good money, uh, that are protected by your union, that have access to good benefits. Uh, I can buy a house, I can buy a car, I can put my kids to school, etc. So that was the good jobs. On the other hand were uh, the bad jobs. And the bad jobs were those deprived of all, all of that. And most of the bad jobs in the past were in what I call proximity services. And proximity services are these sectors of the economy in which basically all workers are busy serving customers through human interaction. So so it's a bit complicated, but the reason why those ended up being bad jobs, there are many reasons, but the key reason is that you can't implement scientific management in proximity services because scientific management works only when there's routine, when tasks can be standardized and there's something that prevents tasks from being standardized, it's interaction with a customer. Because a customer, by definition, is a human being and a human being is so complex and unpredictable and difficult to modernize that you can't fit that human being into scientific management. And so this is why the hotel industry, the restaurant industry, social care, child care, education, and healthcare are so difficult to optimize. You, it's very hard to generate productivity gains in those industries because scientific management is useless. You can't implement scientific management when they're in an industry where there are too many interactions with customers. The problem that we have today is that most jobs are on this side uh, of the economy. Like Manufacturing jobs have disappeared, and so we are stuck with the many jobs in proximity services that have long resisted scientific management, and therefore those are industries where, where there are no productivity gains. And because there are no productivity gains, it's hard to generate that surplus that pays for higher wages, better benefits, uh, a strong bargaining power. And and so that's the problem we're confronted with today. It's that we have dignity in good jobs, in the good jobs of the past, but those are disappearing. And that's manufacturing for, for the most part. 
we don't have dignity in the proximity service jobs, but this is all the jobs that are left in today's economy. And so when you announce to people that have lost their jobs at the factory, well, there's good news because you've lost your job, so, it, so, so that's terrible, but there are so many jobs waiting for you in the large city nearby. You can become a nurse, you can become a child carer, you can become a Starbucks barista, you can become an Uber, Uber driver, or you can clean floors. And those people feel insulted because those are jobs and they come with wages, but it's not the idea that they have a of a job. For them, a job is something that comes with good wage, high benefits, strong union, a sense of belonging and dignity. And so what we need to reinvent to invent today is, well, we need to design new institutions so, so that the bad jobs of yesterday become good jobs today because they will, be good, they will become good jobs, they will come with dignity. Because if it's a good job, you want it, and you feel grateful for having it. And then there's a sense of belonging to the community of workers in that particular industry. Is part of dignity sort of the, the language and, that we use to describe these jobs? Like when David Graeber calls them bullshit jobs, that's you know, not, not uh, dignity-inducing, but just sort of the the approach and language with, with which we describe them? Uh, I, I think there are two different things. So da- David Graeber, it's true, he, he's, he introduced this idea of bullshit jobs, but the fact is that bullshit jobs are mostly white-colored jobs with, that come with a high pay, but people are depressed anyway because they have the impression that well, they, what they're doing all day and sometimes those people work very hard is useless. Like it doesn't create any value and they don't see like the, any outcome to their work. And so they, they, they get depressed because they, they, they don't have a sense of, achieve, of achievement in, in, in their daily experience of work. So that's one thing. And, um, but I don't think uh, that we have a problem with the words we're using. The, the problem with the bullshit jobs is that we use fancy words to describe them, like you're a consultant or you're a manager. And, but, but then you realize that your entire days are spent in useless meetings that don't generate any valuable outcome. And so you, you, we have words that sound fancy to describe a job that is effectively useless and depressing for those who have it. I think the, the the main problem is more about you know high skill low skill. We have this idea that the economy, the labor market, should be divided into you know high skill jobs like that's the creative class, white collars, people making a lot of money, buying a house, uh, having a family, etc. And then there's low skill, uh, and low skills. Oh, you don't know, you don't know anything, so we'll put you in that shitty job that comes with a very low wage and you have no benefits and you can be fired in an instant and don't expect us to treat us well. And what we don't realize is that th- there were jobs in the past that used to be low skill and we turned them into good jobs and that was manufacturing. Like uh, if you were, uh, we, no, none, none of us remembers that because we were not born at the time, but Early in the 20th century, jobs in manufacturing were shitty jobs. No one wanted to do those, to, to have those, because they came with very low wages, terrible conditions. You had to work many hours a day, six days a week. You could be fired in an instant. You could have your hand crushed by a machine. You were then fired without any compensation whatsoever. Unions were forbidden. You couldn't bargain uh, in any way with, your, with management. The reason, and this is why those jobs were mostly uh, occupied by immigrants, because immigrants came in the country, in the US, and said, well, I'm so lucky to be here. I'll take any job. What do you have? And then you would welcome, welcome those Germans and Poles and Irish people and Italians and black people coming from the South and say, well, we don't have much for you. You can become a, a worker on this assembly line, like manufacturing cars. It's very hard. The pay is low, but that's all we have. 
So those immigrants would say, okay, I'll take any job because I'm, I'm grateful to be here and I won't uh, be picky when it comes to uh, uh, cho choosing my jobs, my job. Whereas, uh, and at the same time, like what we would today call real Americans would say, I don't want these jobs because it's the, beneath my dignity precisely. What happened in the meantime, it's that those bad jobs became good jobs, attractive for most people, because we complemented the task that was performed with institutions that turned those jobs into good jobs. Today, if you have a look at the labor market today, oh, oh yes, and by the way, people were not, so the skills weren't higher. What changed between the 1920s and the 1960s it's not the skill level of workers in manufacturing. It's the institutions that contributed to turning those jobs into good jobs. And so today we could do the same for proximity service workers. Like today, if you have a look at that segment of the labor market, you realize that most of those jobs are shitty. No one wants them. And that's why most of those jobs are filled by immigrants or people of color, or women, like uh, people that have a harder time accessing the good, job, the good jobs on the labor market. But the day we design institutions to turn those jobs into good jobs, to make it possible for those low, so-called low-skill workers to become rewarded with a higher salary and better working conditions, then those jobs will become attractive and and suddenly, like white white men will be interested in having those jobs, and you'll see, you'll see more men becoming nurses, uh, you'll see men becoming child carers, uh, uh, and that will be the signal to say that finally those jobs have come from bad to good, and that implies that they come they now come with dignity. How should we think about uh, inequality in a world in which? Uh, everyone's getting richer, but the rich are getting richer faster than than uh, than people who aren't as rich. Should we care about inequality? If so, what should we do about it? I'm not that bothered about inequalities. Uh, inequality. Uh, if you've read my book Hedge, you've probably spotted that inequality is not a word uh, that appears uh, a lot in the book. Uh, I prefer to 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 discuss. Uh, economic security. I think that security, stability is more important for people than inequality. People don't really mind if there are other people that are richer than they are. What they want is that is simply a good life. Like they want their life to be predictable. They want to be covered if there's a some kind of a problem. They want to be provided with opportunities when they need to rebound, etc. So I think that um, inequalities are a feature of the current phase in uh, the current technological revolution, the phase that Carlotta calls uh, the installation phase. So what happens during this phase? Uh, you have two segments of the two parts of the economy that are racing ahead in terms of income, opportunities, wealth, etc. Because the old economy is dying, that makes it possible for those at the top of this old economy to pressure those at the bottom and to force people to renounce high wages, good benefits, and so on. So it's a bit of a caricature, but like private equity fund managers are typical of that part of the economy. Like the old economy is dying. The only way to force those dying companies to create any value is to have them bought out by private equity firms and burdened with debt and forced to to issue dividends to to pay back the debt and they will do anything to achieve that result like they will cut costs and fire workers and 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 go to extreme measures to improve productivity but that's because that's the only way to generate productivity in an economy that's dying and so that creates inequalities because those at the bottom suffer they're fired or they have to renounce uh, their their good wage or they have to work in terrible conditions while those at the top profit of the crisis and the exhaustion by exerting the pressure 
Meanwhile, there's another part of the economy that's the new economy, uh, and that's the entrepreneurs who've understood, who have understood that there are new opportunities to be seized, there are new models to be discovered, there are new technologies that have the potential to unleash like a lot of value uh, of added value. And so those entrepreneurs are seeking, seizing those opportunities while everybody else is, doesn't have a clue about what's going on. And so because you're the first building startups, uh, to, to build startups while everyone else is looking, uh, not understanding what you're doing, that you can get away with reaping great rewards for doing that. And that's precisely like founders and venture capitalists today. They're still profiting off the ignorance of the majority of people that don't understand that the future is all about startups and that the entire workforce should be redeployed in the, in the new economy. And so in, in between those two, you have the majority of workers that simply, well, no, so during this, this transition, so some people profit off the exhaustion of the old model, while some people profit off the birth of the new model. And those are the two groups that become extremely rich. But then, when you reach the end of the, the installation phase, you need to correct that. You need to mitigate the, the adverse consequences of inequalities. If you leave those people, if you let those, uh, those people get away with too much wealth at the expense of all the others, you, the economy will suffocate because that means that people don't have enough money to consume, uh, they're exposed to critical risks that they can't uh, manage. And this will drag the economy down and prevent it from developing further uh, in the future. And, and, and that's the choice that developed nations today are confronted with. Like, do you want to remain among the most advanced nations on earth in the future? That means that you need to uh, build institutions so as to correct the excesses of inequality rising because you need to provide as many people with as many opportunities to consume, to explore, to be more entrepreneurial and so on. And that means redistribution, basically. Uh, if you don't do that, well, you have the minority, the few that will get richer while the other will get poorer and you end up with a third world economy in which that's ruled by the by, by an extractive elite at the expense of developing the entire economy and you, you only need to look at basically every country that's not as developed as the US or Europe to realize what the effect what the consequences are if you don't correct those inequalities then you end up missing all the opportunities that are brought about by economic development. It is interesting. You mentioned, you know, people are more concerned with, um, you know, inequality or security than, than inequality. I remember Paul Graham a few years ago came out with this essay called Inequality, which is basically you know, saying that in order for economic growth or innovation to happen, you know, startups have to be successful, which means there will be billionaires, which means there will be increased inequality yes. and inherent in the system. And people got livid, really, really upset about that. I, I hear much more about inequality than I do about than I do about security. It's, it just seems a sort of counterintuitive thing for people to to understand. It's, envy seems sort of you know deep rooted. But, but but that that's the truth. I mean, uh, so my my friend Roy Bahat, who's the managing partner of Bloomberg Beta in Silicon Valley, uh, so Bloomberg Beta is a VC firm focused on the future of work. And Roy, uh, in partnership with New America, that's a foundation, has spent, spent a, a lot of time like interviewing workers to try to understand what do they expect from work. And he came up with very simple conclusions. People care about two things in that order. First, they want stability. They don't really care if other people are richer than them. What they want is stability for themselves. 
that is economic security. And then if they have stability, the, they'll be happy if they have also dignity in their work, if they can be proud of what they do, if they, if they can introduce themselves as, this is my occupation. So, but that's the two things that people really care about, stability, dignity. And you can realize that inequality is not part of that. Uh, again, people don't care if other people are richer. What they want is that this wealth shouldn't come at the expense of their own security. And this is why I think the conversation is misplaced in most countries in the world today, and especially in the US, because everyone's focusing on inequalities, like, oh, look at those fund managers and CEOs, etc. They are so wealthy, it's intolerable, and while well, people are suffering. But the fact that people are suffering is not, is not because they have less money than others, it's because they're exposed to risks, they don't have access to capital when they need it, and they don't have the capacity to defend their interests. And so I think the response should, shouldn't be higher taxes on the rich, it should be designing that social safety net 2.0 that we need to make the entrepreneurial age more inclusive and more sustainable. Totally. And that, you know, it's, it's, we're talking about redistribution. I'm curious for your, your, your take on which redistributive uh, mechanisms work and which don't. And maybe it's a nice segue into why you think universal basic income is such a bad idea. And maybe you can talk about what you'd prefer instead. Sure. I think redistribution is, that, that's what I called my book Hedge, you need to hedge people against risks. You need to provide them with that economic security that makes it possible for them to choose what they expect from life. Like if you have that floor um, below you that sustains you in, in times of hardship, and then you, you're more serene and you can reflect about the future and about what you'd like to do, and you can be more open to new opportunities because you know that you won't go uh, as low as, as being destitute. So I think the best redistribution is not uh, taking money from the rich to give it to the poor. It's taking money where it is to deploy that safety net that makes possible for everyone to do what they want and to have the best life they can expect. And so it's quite subtle in terms of differences, but, the, but this is precisely the reason why I think universal basic income is focused on the wrong problems. You don't solve the problem of, economic, of widespread economic insecurity by sending a check of $400 every month to everyone, because that kind of money doesn't make it possible for you to afford healthcare or housing in areas where there are jobs waiting for you. You provide people with economic security. So what you need to do is to provide people with the healthcare they need if they're, if they're sick uh, or, or if they have a pre-existing condition and the housing they need so that they're close to where there are jobs waiting for them. And that's not universal basic income. It's much more complex than that. It's a healthcare system that works and that's sustainable financially and that delivers people with what they expect, that is proper care that's affordable. And then there's, it's a housing market that makes it possible for anyone to participate in uh, that feast that is value creation in urban areas uh, and in proximity services today. And the, the, the fact that everyone's talking about basic income, so I have a harsh uh, interpre interpretation of that. I've, basic income is, a, is an idea that's been around for a very long time. It was voiced by Milton Friedman on the right in the 1970s. It has been a passion of leftists for forever. The reason why suddenly everyone's speaking about is talking about basic income is because Silicon Valley has gotten in interested. And I think the reason why Silicon Valley got interested in basic income is a bad reason. What happens is that there's something known as the tech backlash. 
suddenly tech companies and tech people are confronted with a lot of hostility that's widespread in the entire society. And most tech executives and VCs and prominent people in Silicon Valley have been taken aback by, by that new hostility. Like we used to be revered or admired, rewarded, by the, uh, supported by politicians and so on. And suddenly everyone hates us. What happened? And so they start to listen like uh, to, to what, what's been happening. And they realize that, oh, okay, people are suffering. Like they're losing their job. They don't earn as much money as they used to. They're confronted with critical problems like getting, getting sick and not having access to proper care or uh, not being able to pay the rent in, um, in, in cities. So, okay, so what could we do to help those people? And because those, pe those people in Silicon Valley are so busy, like building tech companies and deploying capital in tech companies, they don't have much time to allocate to reflecting on solving all those problems. And so what they're looking for is the simplest solution that's around and the simplest solution that's uh, flattering for uh, the minds of people that are not very no knowledgeable in policy is basic income. Like here we are, we have the simplest solution. We, can, we could send a check to everyone every month. We don't have to bother with a large bureaucracy like inefficient government uh, managing a complex system. It's the simplest, most elegant solution to all those problems that we didn't really care about, but apparently they, they, they contribute to the tech backlash. So we need to do something about it. Um, well, the news is it's more complex than that. You don't solve healthcare plus housing plus pensions plus the school system plus many other things simply by sending a check to everyone. You need to do the hard entrepreneurial work of trying and failing and failing and failing until you finally discover the policy or the institution that works and delivers the outcome that you're looking for. And that's what social and political history is about. It's about people fighting other people to force government to try new things and finally come up with the solution that works for the majority. And this is very hard work. And you need to realize that that work was done in the US following the Great Depression. So when basically no one had anything to lose at trying new things. And in Europe, we, we were not even able to do that. We had to go through World War II and millions of people dying before we realized we really need to do something and provide people with economic security. Otherwise, there'll be uh, widespread instability and democracy will be destroyed and fascism will rise again and so on. And so that's very hard work and you need more resources and more attention and more ideas than simply sending a check to everyone every month. You need to do that work. And, and for that work to be done, you need everyone to participate. You need the industry to participate because they know they're, they're the ones that know the new world better. The uh, entrepreneurs are the ones discovering the new world. So they have many things to teach us. But you need politicians that are ready to take those ideas and translate them into the, the language of policy. And also you need uh, intellectuals that provide everyone with new ideas. And you need a civil society that's organized enough to exert pressure on all those people to force them to come up with new ideas and to, to try new things. And so I think this is the problem that we have both in the US and Europe. It's that we don't have all of that at the same time. Like in the US, you have a, a thriving tech industry. You have entrepreneurs that have understood that understand everything about the new models, the new ways of creating value, what the future of work is about. But uh, you don't really have the politicians that are interested in using all that and coming up with new I policy ideas. Uh, that's especially not the case with the Trump administration. You, you have kind of... Um, kind of a, an organized civil society. Like there are many things happening on the ground, obviously, many activists, many 
union leaders trying to organize workers that were previously not organized. And you have the intellectuals. So I, I would say the U.S. is not that badly positioned. Is not, the position of the U.S. is not that bad. But what you clearly lack is forward-looking politicians, the, the Roosevelt's of the day that will, you know, take all this knowledge and all those ideas and all the help they can get to try and invent the new institutions that will make the new economy more sustainable and more inclusive. In Europe, it's even worse. We don't have the politicians. We don't have the tech industry. We barely have some intellectuals thinking about all that. Uh, and we don't really have an organized civil society exerting pressure on everyone to, to come up with new ideas. So I think the U.S. is, despite the Trump administration, is still better positioned than Europe to come up with new ideas. But I think in the meantime, there's another country that's making great progress, and it's China, uh, because China has everything that you need to invent to come up with a new social contract for a new economy. They have a thriving tech industry. They have a government that really cares about those things because the Chinese government is obsessed with stability because they know that if there's no stability in China, the, the Chinese people won't tolerate the, the rule of the Communist Party anymore. Uh, they're, they're experimenting a lot in terms of providing people with affordable housing, building a new healthcare system that didn't exist because China was underdeveloped, building a new education system, experimenting with social credit and so on. And so maybe China is now leading the pack because not only do they have the thriving tech industry, of, uh, a thriving tech industry of their own, they're also leading the race in terms of inventing new institutions that are in line with uh, the entrepreneurial age. When, when China is compared to the U.S., it's often you know both governmentally, but also sort of the centralization versus decentralization. Do you have any frameworks for thinking about which is better or more, or more constructive, or or broadly, what what should we be copying from from China and the way that they're doing things? I'm not sure we can copy much from China because China, that's the problem. Like the Chinese coming up with their own version of the New Deal for today's economy. But they have the luxury to do that because they are still developing and they, they don't have legacy standing in the way and they, can, and they have a strong central government that's, that's willing to experiment with new things all the time. And when they sense that something's working, they're ready to deploy extraordinary amounts of resources to make it work. And so... What we, we, we can get some inspiration from China, but it's more about the method rather than what they're actually building. Because what they're building is a version of the, of, of a new New Deal that's in line with the Chinese way of life or Chinese values, or I don't even know what, what to use, but uh, China is not a lib liberal democracy. They don't value individual freedom as much as us in the West. And so the institutions that they're currently designing to provide people with economic security and access to capital and, and other things are institutions that are shaped by the Chinese culture. And that culture doesn't, doesn't include the importance of individual freedom. So that means that's a problem for us in the West. That means that we can't wait for the Chinese to come up with ideas, with solutions, because we already know that those solutions won't be, replicate, uh, won't be replicable in the West because they'll be radically incompatible with our way of life and our values. They'll be perfect for the Chinese, not perfect for us, far from it. So the method can be a source of inspiration like relying on your tech industry to have a better understanding of what's going on than having the government being entrepreneurial and trying new things, different things in the different parts of the country, and then seeing what works, what doesn't work, and then expanding from there. And all of that with a very clear strategic long-term goal that is 
developing the economy, making it, making it stronger, more inclusive, and more sustainable. I would say that we don't have that luxury in the West. Like we don't have governments that are as strategic as willing to spend to do what it takes to experiment new things. We have governments that are feeble, short-term oriented, uh, without imagination, disconnected from all the, the ideas that are coming out of the tech industry. And that's the real problem when you compare the West and China. It's that they have a government that, that is do, doing exactly what, it, what is needed in this time in uh, in this time of transition and we don't and and, and part of it's because they they have you know a, a government structure that allows them to you know it's much more centrally planned balaji srinivasan and and a few others have this sort of vision for the charter city movement where there's sort of two major changes one is that you know countries are run more like china or more like singapore where there's effectively ceos uh instead of uh you know democracies or democratic republics and then two that uh, there are many, many of them of all stripes where you can sort of switch uh, between them. Um, and if you, you don't have voice, but you do have exit. Are you, is that your utopia as well? And, and what do you think about that? Well, I, I know that framework. I'm, I'm a great admirer of Banaji's um, ideas. And um, so my ideas about that is that we need to realize that nation states are a very recent invention. Like even in the 19th century, nation states did, didn't weigh as much on the international scene. And, and, and if you go back in history, you realize that uh, th- there was a time when nation states didn't even exist and the world was ruled and organized by cities, monarchs, guilds, corporations, and various other organizations. And so I think we need to to be humble when it comes to the future of the nation state and realize that maybe if we're going through a paradigm shift, that means that uh, many things will go down the drain, including the idea that nation states are the primary level of organization, of organizing society in the world. Um, So in the book, I draw a parallel between um, uh, the digital economy and what, what is known as talassocracies. So talassocracies are so cities, basically, or countries that derive their power and influence and wealth from their mastering the sea and the trade routes that go across the sea and that connects them to, to, to distant parts of the world. And so Britain has been a talassocracy for a time during the 19th century. Uh, Most of their wealth was extracted from the empire and the empire was made possible by the British mastery of the sea and of the trade routes. Another example is the Republic of Venice, uh, much older. And Venice is interesting because if so, most of us have have visited Venice and you realize it's a tiny city, but you need to realize that at some point in history, that tiny city was like the wealthiest place on place on earth and the controlled trade routes that went all through the, all the way through Asia and part of Africa. And that's because they were, they had the best sailors and the, the largest ships and the best traders and the best financiers and so on. And so you can be a tiny country and control and create a vast amount of wealth uh, well beyond your borders. If you organize, you organize to, to take advantage of the key resource of the day. And so at the time, the key resource was the sea. If you, if you were mastering the sea, you, as tiny as you were as the Republic of Venice, you could be a wealthy and developed nation. Today, what's the key resource? It's the resource made available by computing and networks. And so that's mostly like individual individuals connected together through networks and from which you can collect data uh, and so on. And so the, the countries 
or the cities or the organizations that in the future will learn to harness this resource and to master it will be able, regardless of their size, to emerge as the most advanced and developed areas in the world. And there's no reason reason to think that those organizations will necessarily be nation states. Like you have some examples of nation states like Singapore, Israel, I think, uh, is a good example. Estonia is trying hard, but uh, they've not succeeded yet, far from it. So you have countries that have realized that you need to be to 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 take advantage of what the economy is about and what the key resource is about and what the new technology of the day is about. And those countries have redeployed and redesigned their entire economy so as to take advantage of that. So again, Singapore is working hard on that. Israel is probably one of the most advanced nations on earth taking advantage of that. California, Silicon Valley, in a way, is doing exactly that although they're dependent on the, that nation that they belong to, which is the U.S., which has a lot of problems. But I think you, you don't necess- necessarily need to be a nation state to do that. You can be a city, you can be a networked organization of sorts, uh, if you can accumulate enough resources so as to redeploy your operations and take advantage of what the new economy is about, then you can become the Venice, Venice of, uh, of the day. And, and, and in that regard, Charter City is, I think, a promising model if you can find the territory and the population and uh, the early adopters that will support you in that effort. And, and what do you think Silicon Valley can learn from some of the examples you brought up from some of the, you know, not just successes, but, but failures so that Silicon Valley can extend its reign because, you know, with the rise of, uh, charter cities with the rise of, of crypto, the rise of decentralization, people like Balaji are short San Francisco in, in the long term. And so uh, what can San Francisco, uh, Silicon Valley learn to, uh, to extend its reign, if anything? Well, actually, so housing is a very good example. I think one of the things that's killing Silicon Valley at the moment is the housing market. Like you don't build enough. It's, it's become uh, uh, houses in Silicon Valley or apartments are, have become unaffordable for many people, including young engineers joining tech companies. And so that, 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 that has become a deterrent for talent. Like if you offer uh, a young engineer, young ambitious engineer with the choice of be, going to Austin or Silicon Valley, they usually, they might pick Austin because Austin houses are still affordable, whereas in Silicon Valley, they're not. So that's a good example of what's dragging Silicon Valley down. It's the fact that uh, you can only succeed if, like the Republic of Venice in its time, you solve the problems that makes it hard for you to attract what you need to to keep on developing your economy. And that includes capital, but also talent and many other things. Compare that to Singapore. Singapore has always been an island. Like There are 5 million people living there uh, on a tiny piece of earth piece of land and and Lee Kuan Yew, the founding father of Singapore, uh, passed away in 2015. So early on that he had to solve the housing housing problem if he wanted to maintain stability and cohesion on this tiny island. Like because Singapore could have become a piece of land owned by just a few extremely wealthy landlords extracting that wealth from everyone else and effectively choking the economy. So what Lee Kuan Yew did in reaction to that is he decided that all the land would be owned by the government. And then the government would build high-rise buildings on this land. And then people could buy apartments in those buildings, but only for a 99th period of time. That's a lease. Uh, and at the end of the 99 years, the apartment goes back to the government, which then sells it to another family. And that's a clever way of retaining the land rent for 
the government and thus the nation, as opposed to that land being, being owned by private individuals. And that made it possible, that created a context in which there's always an incentive to build more, and the government is taking charge of that, and, but, but people own their, their apartments for a very long time, which means that they have a sense of ownership, and that means that they are taking care of the apartment instead, um, instead of acting like tenants and don't care, not caring about uh, the state of, 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 uh, uh, of housing. And so this is what every area in the world should do because the digital, that's the bad news. The digital economy is an economy that's concentrated in cities. That's its nature. That's because tech companies need to be close to one another. Uh, and that's because engineers want to live in cities. And, and then all the jobs created for all the others are in proximity services, which means that the uh, those jobs multiply in areas where there are dense populations. And so in the future, the problems that Silicon Valley is encountering will exist in every large city. And the only city that will overcome those problems are those who take radical measures when it comes to regulating the housing market and to prevent the housing rent from being owned by wealthy individuals choking the rest of the economy. And so that's typical. That is why I would uh, short Silicon Valley as opposed to places like Singapore, uh, simply by having a look at uh, does the local authorities, whether private or public, create the conditions for the sustained growth of that highly concentrated economy, especially by building enough houses and preventing the rent from being captured by private interests. Would you also short the U.S.? Well, um, I think the U.S. is a very resourceful nation. But, you know, so I'm in Europe. So uh, I'm French, living in London, uh, going through the whole Brexit uh, uh, saga at the moment. Um, when we look at the U.S. from Europe, what we see is a country that will probably overcome its, uh, its problems at some point, that has a lot of resources, entrepreneurs, wealth, talent, etc. But what would change in the future is that we, we, we were used, we Westerners in Europe, to belonging to the same, you know, the same block as the U.S., like U.S., Western Europe was the same world, same values. Uh, same interests, uh, same culture, same movies. Uh, I think in the future, the U.S. will, well, you, you have the privilege of being kind of an island, like you, the U.S., uh, it's most of the Northern American continent. And so you don't really need others to survive and to expand and to develop and to build new things. So what I expect is not that the U.S. will go down. It's just that it will be more isolated from the rest of the world and, and there will be a growing distance between the U.S. and Europe. And so you Americans probably don't really care about that, except that Europe, you need to reflect on the fact that Europe is a very important market that makes quite a significant proportion of the PNL of most of your companies. And if Europe, um, if the bridge widens between no, sorry, if the gap widens between Europe and the US, that will be lost. Probably Europe will become a market for Chinese companies rather than American companies. But apart from that, you don't really need Europe. Whereas we, Europe, we kind of need the US. Well, we, we've needed you for a long time. And so now that we see the US drifting away, we need to reflect on our own positioning in the world. And what do we do about China? What do we do about Africa? What do we do with Russia? Uh, those are the conversations that are going on in Europe at the moment. I wouldn't short the U.S., I, uh, but I would expect the U.S. to be more of its own, on its own rather than part of a larger block. It, it seems that one of the debates we're having is, is the, 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 you know, the relationship between the private and the public sphere. Like I was watching the, the, uh, the Libra hearings when AOC was questioning David Marcus as to 
uh, whether currency is a public good. And he mm-hmm. said, it's not up for me to, to decide. And, and in your book, if you talk about how the, the, the power rests with you know, and responsibility rests with technology companies rather than governments and technology companies aren't accountable to the public in the same way. How do you think about the, the, the realm between private and public um, and how does that evolve over time and, and what, can we, what can we expect? I'm always using the same story and it's a great story. It's the story of the Rothschild family in the 19th century. And it's been documented, documented by Nia Ferguson in his uh, biography of the Rothschild family. So you can read it in details. But So in the 19th century, Europe was as fragmented as it is today. There were different countries, Germany, France, Spain, Britain, etc. And those countries didn't even belong to the same international organization. There was no, no such thing as the European Union at the time. There were some treaties, but very loose, very flexible, that like didn't uh, impose much on the, on the parties that had have, that have signed those treaties. And yet, between 1815 and World War I, there were no major conflicts between European nations, like no war that caused the death of millions, millions of people. How did that happen? And so the theory, so I'm not sure that Ferguson writes about that, but Karl Polanyi's theory in his book, The Great Transformation, that was published in 1944, is that peace was maintained in Europe in the absence of international organizations designed for maintaining peace thanks to bankers, financiers. And that's because there were those families, including the Rothschild, lending money to every government in Europe. And what happens if you lend money to every government in Europe? You don't want those governments to go at war because war means that one government will become insolvent and your debt, the debt won't be paid back. And so your interest as a financier is that peace is maintained. And the Rothschild particularly, and that is documented in Ferguson's book, how did they maintain peace? They had an information system. So the the history is fascinating. So the story is fascinating. There were five brothers sent all across Europe by the old father. So one of them was in Britain, first Manchester and then London. The other was in Paris. Uh, The third one was in Vienna, Austria. The fourth one was in Naples, Italy. And the fifth one uh, remained in Frankfurt with his father. And every day, every brother would write letters to, to the four others to share everything that was happening in their city. Like not only business, but also politics, gossips, culture, everything. And so all all the five brothers at all times had that information system, all the letters, and were uh, aware of everything that was happening all across Europe. And they could decide based on that. They could spot the tensions and the threats of war and the conflicts between governments and then exert subtle pressure on governments to, so as to maintain peace between them. Like, maybe you should settle this conflict with your neighbor because otherwise we won't lend you the money that you need to pay, uh, to pay your soldiers next month. So I find this story fascinating because I think that technology today creates the conditions in which... Um, private, privately owned organizations can rise again and contribute to maintaining peace between nations in the absence of international treaties or international organizations. And Libra is very interesting in that respect because Libra, if it works, will mean that we'll have this global infrastructure for payments that will be operated by an association based in Geneva of all cities, like the city where the League of Nations were, was created 
after World War I. And that global infrastructure will be independent to a certain extent from governments. And governments will have to take that into account before deciding on their policy and, and, and their diplomacy and their strategic positioning on the global stage. And so I think uh, we're about to witness the, uh, the rise of a world in which peace and prosperity will be delivered more by global non-government organizations than by governments themselves. And it's exactly the situation that existed in Europe in the 19th century. And so, so this is why I think the, the, the history of Europe is very relevant to understand today's world, and especially in the 19th century. Uh, basically, that, that's another message that I use a lot. It's that today's world resembles, resembles the 19th century much more than the 20th century in many respects international relations will be more like in the 19th century. Um, many industries will go back to the state where they were, in which they were in the 19th century. Uh, the financial system will probably uh, be more similar to that of the 19th century uh, than the 20th century. And maybe the safety net will also be uh, more similar to, to, to what we had in the 19th century that is relying on guilds and you know mutual credits and uh, and other things do you think the uh, private companies need to change their structure in some way uh, where they you know uh, where they have much more uh, stakeholders where users become stakeholders in some way or they're more like b corps or or do you think that's overrated as in terms of the power of you know legal structure to influence uh, I think that when it comes to how private companies are designed, the the mode of production trumps the governments. That is, what comes first is how exactly do we create value in this economy? And it all depends on the paradigm. Like, we're in the age of computing and networks. We're in the age of entrepreneurs, uh, the entrepreneurial age. And that's what determines how a company should be designed and governed. And then you can add uh, some twists to that to correct some excesses and, and so on. But, 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 but you don't have, um, it won't change much. I, I think today the, the key to understand, to understanding tech companies is to realize that the most powerful constituency in the corporate world today is the consumers. And that's because the consumers are free to access information, to connect together, to pool their power, to help each other reach better, make better purchase, purchasing, purchase decisions. And companies can only be competitive if, if they realize that they now have to deal with powerful consumers. And that's exactly, and so the model for me is Amazon, like Jeff Bezos from day one literally has decided that he would be at the service of Amazon's customers. And this submission to what the customer wants and what they need and how you, you can delight them uh, would determine Amazon's success over the long term. And so we're now 25 years later and we can realize that he, I mean, he's the best strategist in the corporate world today because he figured it out at the time. He realized that the internet would empower consumers so much that the only way to be competitive as a company would be to, to submit to, 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 to your customers. And that comes at the expense of the other constituencies that are part of that world, that is shareholders. Amazon's shareholders haven't seen a dividend, a dividend for decades. And then workers, workers have having a hard time, uh, having a very hard time working at Amazon because they have, they're here to serve the, cust the very demanding customers, and that's what the company is about. And so I think that being a B Corp, or you know, um, you can correct some excesses. Like maybe there's too much pressure on on workers, and you can tweak the governance to to empower the workers a bit against the consumers. 
but you can only go as far. Uh, it's, it's only at the margin that you can correct some things. But first, you need to realize what the new world is about and how companies should be designed to, to thrive in this new world. And they shouldn't be designed like a 19, like, like a 21st, like a 20th century car manufacturer. They should be designed more like Amazon. Makes sense. Another one of the debates that we've been having is between nationalism and, and globalism. And, and that is sort of, you know, you know, Brexit and, and Trump are two sort of, uh, you know, arrows in the quiver of, of national, the rise of nationalism. And we talked about China earlier, you know, very nationalistic compared to the more global inclusive uh, nature of U- U.S. and Europe. I'm, I'm curious how you think about that divide, how that evolves, how that relates to things like uh, immigration and trade, what you think the ideal uh, and most effective stance would be, and who, who we should all learn from. So first of all, going back to the idea of a thalassocracy, if you want to succeed as an economy in today's world, you need to be able to support your local tech companies as they expand beyond your borders. And so that means that any country that harbors successful tech companies should be in favor of free trade. Because uh, if you're the US, you have Google and you have Facebook and you have Amazon and you have many other, and you have Airbnb and you want those companies to be able to operate at a global scale rather than being trapped on their national, on their domestic market. And so that means that you need to reach out as a government to other governments to negotiate trade deals trade agreements that make room for those companies to expand. That's your interest. And the fact that Trump is not doing that goes directly against the interests of the U.S. tech industry today. So that's the first thing. Uh, The other thing is that because the new paradigm brings about new jobs that are shitty at first, no one wants those jobs except for, remember, immigrants. And so you, you need immigrants if you want to succeed in the transition, you need immigrants because immigrants are usually the best entrepreneurs. And it's a fact that during many transitions in the past, the most successful companies were created, were uh, founded by entrepreneurs. Like Carnegie was an, by immigrants, sorry. Carnegie was an immigrant from Scotland. And, and, and you know that today, more, more than half of the successful companies in Silicon Valley are effectively founded by immigrants. But you, you don't need immigrants only to found companies. You also need immigrants to staff companies, especially when it comes to staffing the jobs that no one wants because those jobs are new. They come with low wages, terrible conditions. We don't really understand how to make those jobs more attractive at first. And so you need those immigrants to take those new jobs that, that are hard and badly paid. And this is why the, the U.S. that was already dominating the global economy in the paradigm of the steel industry went on to dominate again in the paradigm of the car industry. And that's because they had so many immigrants coming in the U.S. early in the 20th century that they were able to staff those assembly lines and support the fast growth of car manufacturers in Detroit. Without the immigrants, Detroit wouldn't exist because Henry Ford might have been the best industrialist of his time. He, if no one wanted to take those jobs, well, he couldn't grow his company. And so you need immigrants. Uh, So you need free trade because it's the digital economy and you need, you need room to, to to expand at a global scale. You need immigration because we, we're going through a paradigm shift and we need people to staff the new jobs. And But third, you also need stability because the transition is a very dangerous period during which a lot of people are suffering. Many people are losing their jobs. And many things that were taken for granted disappear before our eyes. And that leads people to get very angry and to vote for fascists and populists and racists and et cetera. And so how do you reconcile the three? Like you need free trade, you need immigration, but you also need political stability. Um, and this is why I think China is racing ahead. It's because they have free trade and they exp- they're, they're doubling down on free trade along the Belt and Road Initiative thanks to the Belt and Road Initiative, all across Central Asia and Africa and, 
and Russia. They have immigration, not because people are moving to China from abroad. It's because China is such a large country that many people are migrating from Western China, the countryside, to the large city on the coasts. And so they have those people coming from the countryside ready to take any job because they're immigrants. They might be Chinese citizens, but they're immigrants nonetheless. They're coming from far away in China. But China also have also has stability because they have this strong government that basically censors everything that goes against inst uh, stability, the stability of the regime. And so in a weird way, they've managed to reconcile the three. They, 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 have, full, they have free trade, they have immigration that's internal, and they have the political stability that makes it possible for them to move forward quite fast in the transition without too much political turmoil. So compare that with the US. The US is retreating from free trade agreements. The US is closing its borders for, to immigration. And you don't even have the stability as a reward for that. So that could mean that you're screwing the transition and losing the advantage that you had because the tech industry was born in the US. But if you want to race ahead in the new economy, as a country, you know, you need more than a local thriving tech industry. You also need the right institutions to make the economy more inclusive and more sustainable. But you need, gen, you need GM and Ford, and then you need the New Deal that Roosevelt designed two decades after that. And if you only have the successful companies without the, the appropriate institutions, with that well-designed institutions, you, you're missing parts of the equation. And I think China is doing both at the same time because they have the stability and they can enjoy the benefits of immigration and free trade without, win, without putting their political system in danger. I want to be, be respectful of your time and end on two, uh, two questions. The, the first question is, you mentioned these three authors in the, in the book, and I'm curious if you can, you know, from what we haven't discussed, can you sort of take apart the key idea for, from each thinker? So, so they're Bill Janeway, Carl Polanyi, and Martin Gurry. Can you sort of take away what uh, the key significance of those, those three thinkers? Sure. So uh, Bill Janeway has been a friend for, for uh, years now, and he, he's basically a veteran of the VC industry. But the way he, introduces, he usually introduces himself is, I'm a political economist, a scholar that has gone through, a, that took a sabbatical for 35 years as a venture capitalist. And so he started his career as a political economist in Cambridge University uh, in, in, in Britain, realized that he couldn't become um, an academic because, because what he had learned um, uh, and written about in his PhD was not in line with what economics department were expecting at the time. And so he decided to leave, had a successful career in investment banking and then venture capital. He ended up being a senior vice president at Warburg Pincus, uh, did a few great investments, uh, several great investments in the 90s during the bubble in mostly enterprise um, technology, and then uh, retired and went back to Cambridge to teach and research uh, in economics. And so he wrote this book called, uh, titled Doing Capitalism in, in the Innovation Economy, that, which is a brilliant book because it's an inspiring autobiography. He basically tells about his life as first an economist, then an investment banker, then a VC, and then an economist again. And bringing together all those skills and and this double background as both a theorist and a practitioner, he provides a compelling and a picture of the world we inhabit today. Like everything is explained in this book is from uh, the world of entrepreneurs, uh, the interactions between entrepreneurs, the financial system and the state, to the rise of China, to the backlash against tech companies and so on. And so his point of view is unique, and I really encourage uh, you and anyone who listens to read the book. So that's Bill. Uh, Karl Polanyi, he um, is um, 
So he, he's a Hungarian. Basically, he had a basically a terrible life. So he was born in Hungary, studied in Vienna, was a Jew and a socialist. So he had to flee Austria when Hitler invaded Austria, and that was the Anschluss, Anschluss, 1938. So he settled first in London, then settled in the US and had to live in Canada because his wife was a communist and was personal non grata on US territory. So uh, Karl Polanyi is basically a historian and an economist that had that terrible life, like constantly fleeing and, and dealing with hostility from the Nazis, Cartesian, okay. well, you get the point, McCarthy um, and the Red Scare um, in the US. But he wrote that book uh, called The Great Transformation that was published in 19, 1944. That is basically the book. So it's a book that explains the previous paradigm shift. It explains how the rise of the car industry of the new mode of production and consumption and the new experience of work led to a backlash by Western societies. And that backlash was managed in a very different way from one country to another. There were countries that resisted the backlash, like the UK and the US to a certain extent, but other countries that couldn't sustain the backlash against the rising industry of the day and the harsh conditions that it imposed on workers. And those countries were Germany and Italy. And the backlash translated into the rise of fascism, fascism uh, being a complex phenomenon, but basically it was business leaders in Germany seeing all those union leaders, socialists and communists in their factories, and they decided that it was not tolerable, tolerable, tolerable and they they decided to make an alliance with these with these uh, far right militias that were ready to, to to basically fight with the socialists in the factories to prevent um, unrest and the su support of business leaders to the rising uh, Nazi party in Germany is effectively what what turned Hitler from a fringe radical leader to an acceptable politician and helped him. Raised, rise to power and, and, and trigger World War II and the death of millions. So Polanyi published his book in 1944, that is at the end, almost close to the end of World War II. And so it's a fascinating ret retrospect about how an entire world that everyone took for granted at the end of the 19th century can be destroyed by radical change in the economic sphere unrest and anger and revolutions in reaction to the rise of a new technology and and all the way to the rise of fascism and and world war ii so i think and, it's and it's highly people, relevant to what's happening to these days and some people say that we uh you know because of the, the rise of hitler and sort of disastrous effects that that produced we've sort of overextended too much in sort of our fear of, of a leader with a bold vision for society or, or anyone who says anything along, you know, uh, along the lines of, Hey, uh, you know, people aren't equal and some people are better at certain things and we should, you know, put people where they're great at, you know? And so there's this, that we've sort of overextended because of the fear of anything like that happening again. Do you think that is uh, accurate or do you think that, that overextending it to the extent that it's happening uh, is a good thing and something we should keep doing? Sorry, I'm not sure I understand the, the question, but, um, if I might try, so I, I think the message here is that paradigm shifts are dangerous because they create so much disorder where there was order before that the entire society is taken aback by this unexpected disorder and people are suffering and the edit is weakened and many institutions crumble and disappear. And you enter a very dangerous territory in which a race is on between those who want to exploit this rising anger for the benefit of making more money or implementing their radical ideas or 
uh, expressing their hatred of Jews or immigrants or others. And, and those are racing against other people that are more forward looking and more aware of what's going on and that are willing to do what it takes to deploy the new institutions that will appease society and put it on the right track in terms of making the most of the new paradigm of the day. So basically that's, that's the history of the Western world in the 1930s. Like the US could have given birth to its own version, version of fascism in reaction to the Great Depression. Fortunately, for many reasons, uh, the US elected Roosevelt, and Roosevelt was a smart man. He didn't have a lot of ideas himself, but he was surrounded by very clever people that were ready to experiment with many different things. Many of those things didn't work. It was the, what, what is known as the first New Deal. But then they came up with the, what is known as the second New Deal, which led to founding Fannie Mae and Social Security and empowering unions and providing them with bargaining power. And that basically put the U.S. on the right track and made it possible for the U.S. to avoid the rise of fascism. We in Europe were not as lucky because some countries didn't witness the rise of fascism, uh, like uh, the U.K. and France. But we had that country right in the middle of the continent that was Germany, in which the paradigm shift led to unrest in factories and fears felt by, uh, by the ruling elite. And the elite was so frightened by those socialists uh, invading their factories that they decided to strike hard and to, and to, and to make an unholy alliance with those terrible people that were the Nazis and the rest is history. So, so I think we, we should, that's Polanyi's message. Like you shouldn't compare Trump to Hitler. That's irrelevant. What you should have in mind is that we're going through a very dangerous phase in which nothing could, should be taken for granted. You can overcome that and rebound and become a prosperous, secure, serene society like the U.S. was after World War II, or, well, to a certain extent, there was segregation and many other problems. Or you can go the German way and overreact to all of that and, and, and end up with, uh, with today's version of fascism and, and a new world war. And so we, which do you pick between the two? Obviously, the first option that... But it's history, and so you can't you can't really draw many lessons from history, except that there are dangers, and we 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 need to deal handle those dangers with what we have today, and we need to come up with a faithful understanding of what today's world is about, and and that understanding will make it possible to invent the new institutions that we need. How about uh, Martin Gurry? So Martin Gurry, so he's um, so I, I know he's he's quite popular in Silicon Valley, and that's because he wrote a book in 2014 called "The Revolt of the Public." And Martin's story is fascinating because he never wrote in his life except for his employer, that was the CIA. Uh, he had an, a, a, an entire career as a CIA analyst focused on media, global media. Like he was the one reading every paper published uh, everywhere in the world to try and spot public sentiment regarding the U.S. and if uh, U.S. interests were threatened or supported by public opinions or various parties in, in every country in the world. And what he saw as an analyst at the CIA was that there was a radical change happening around 2010 or 2011. And that was the point when information coming out of individuals overtook in terms of volume and and scale and impact the information coming from institutional sources. So basically 2011 is the year when we ceased to listen to uh, media organizations or politicians or experts 
and we decided to listen to our peers, other individuals, and uh, using social media. And that led to a completely different experience of demo- of politics and democracy. And that's because today we don't get our information and we don't uh, get inspiration from institutions or experts or the elites. We get our inspiration from people like us to which we're connected, to whom we're connected through social media. And that means that you can explain all you want if you're part of the elite. No one's listening to you. On the other hand, if you want to be listened to, you need to, to exploit this new, to inhabit this new media landscape and to make the most of the opportunity to to resonate with those networked individuals that listen to each other uh, using social media. And so what Martin explains in in his book, so the the story of Martin in Silicon Valley is that the book was read by uh, people like Mark Andreessen and then Trump was elected two years after and all those people said, oh my God, like everything was predicted by this book self-published by this obscure CIA analyst. And so Patrick Collison read the book and decided to publish it through the new publishing arm that was launched by Stripe called Stripe Press. And so the relaunch of the book last year, so two years after Trump's election, made it an instant hit in Silicon Valley and, and beyond. And so Martin is basically the one who analyzing inform, how inv- information was produced and was flowing from his desk at the CIA predicted that every democracy in the world would be soon overwhelmed by the, the amount of information uh, produced by individuals and the anger and se- sentiment of revolt that this free flow of information through social media would unleash uh, in people. And so it all led to, and and then you can revisit everything that happens in uh, Western democracies uh, in recent years. Like Obama was a byproduct of that. Like Obama was uh, the man of the public in revolt and his campaign famously was the first campaign uh, almost the first campaign ever to use social media at a large scale. So Obama is an example of a politician that succeeds in the new age of the revolt of of the public. Trump is a very different version of that, but Trump also rose to prominence because he was connected to the public using social media. Uh, Macron in France, uh, my country, is also a creature of the revolt of the public. So it's an ex- unexpected outcome because Macron is the embodiment of the French elite, but he was an outsider in the political system, was never elected to office before he ran for president. And he effectively won to everyone's surprise because he was lifted up by these communities of people that decided that they'd had enough with the old elite and they wanted someone new. So it's basically Martin and I share a common framework to understand today's economy. So I usually explain it's a framework I came up uh, when I wrote my first book in French seven years ago. To, and that book was had a very simple purpose. It was to explain the digital economy to the French elite. And in that book, my co-author and I, went to a great extent to try and come up with a very simple definition of what the digital economy is about. And the core idea that we put for, um, that, that we brought forward in the book is in the digital economy, there's more power outside than inside organizations. That's the only thing you need to understand to, if you want to understand everything that's happening these days. There's more power outside than inside organizations. So it's new because in the past, the most powerful organizations were those who concentrated power in on the inside. Like you were the most powerful organizations, organization if you had the most employees or the most valuable assets 
the brand that everyone knew or the patent uh, for a technology that was unique. And, and that's how you, you were building successful organizations by concentrating power on the inside. Today, um, the dominant organizations of the day are those who have realized that individuals are no, now more powerful than organizations and that have redesigned themselves so as to harness that power from the outside and to use that power to, to do what, whatever they want to do. Like for, for corporations, it's about making profits. And so that's what Facebook is doing. Facebook is harnessing the power of people individuals craving for connections exchanging content data and so on and facebook translates that into profits but uh, in other contexts it's about winning a polit uh, uh, political campaign like obama used the power on the in on the outside the power of individuals that were willing to to do what it takes to support him and to donate small amounts of money and to convince their neighbors that they should vote for Obama uh, rather than John McCain. And then Trump did the same. And so this is how you win today. It's uh, when you realize that the public has the power, you create that connection with the public that makes it possible to resonate with the public and then to use the public's power to serve whatever goal you have, whether it's making profits, delivering better public services, uh, advocating ideas, or winning campaigns. Awesome. And then la lastly, what would be your, you know, you mentioned earlier that this is going to take some experimentation like startups. So uh, if, if the world came to you and asked for your sort of request for experimentation, if there were hackathons, if you know, all different types of people were thinking about this, what's an idea we haven't talked about that you want people to experiment with or, or push or, or what's your hobby horse that you want people to spend more time thinking about? So the reason I focused my book on the, so, the safety net, so originally the, the idea of this book came from one of my co-founders and he said, you should write a book about tech and policy in the age of the tech backlash. Like that was the first idea of the book. And then I decided to focus on the safety net because I think it's the policy that makes the most sense for ordinary people. Like if you talk to, someone in the street and you ask, what do you, what do you really expect from the government? Uh, if they're very angry, they'll say, I want less immigrants in this country and, and we need to close the borders. But most people will be more like moderate and pragmatic. pragmatic. They'll say, you know, I don't want much. I want a good job uh, that comes with a good income. And if I have a problem, I want to be covered. That's all I want. A good job, good income being covered in case of a problem. And so this is all what the safety net is about. It's about providing people with good jobs, stability, and coverage in case, in case of a problem. And so uh, I think, you, you know, many people are focused on inequalities like raising taxes on the rich or closing borders or more free trade, less free trade. Uh, I, I don't think... The, those really matter. I think that what matters is providing people with what they need, a good job, good income, stability, security. And so I think that people today, whether they're entrepreneurs or policymakers or activists or intellectuals or citizens, should be reflecting on all that. that what's a good job? What's lacking in today's jobs to make them good jobs? How can we provide people with access to capital when they need it? That is when they're switching jobs. So that's a significant part of entrepreneurs in fintech are focused on that today. So how do you cover uh, the financial needs that people have today that aren't covered by the traditional financial system? And the other thing is how, how do you help people connect to each other so that they take charge? Like, in an age in which technology is so widespread and governments are so feeble and powerless, we shouldn't wait for governments to solve our problems. We should just take charge, but not take charge like uh, as individuals uh, fighting against each other. We should take charge like collectively by using this technology that, that is available to 
try and support each other in overcoming the many obstacles and problems that are rising in today's economy. And so I, I think... I think it should be the priority today. Like, How do we cover people against risks? How do we provide them with capital when they need it? And how do we help people organize and defend their interests and seek better opportunities? Nicholas, it's been over uh, two and a half hours, much more than I thought, but this was such a fascinating conversation. The, the book mm-hmm. is Hedge, and definitely check out a lot of uh, Nicholas's posts on Medium and his, uh, his email newsletter and a lot of the great content the family puts out. Uh, thank you so much for, for coming on the podcast. Thanks, Eric. It was a pleasure. If you're an early stage entrepreneur, we'd love to hear from you. Please hit us up at villageglobal.vc slash network catalyst. 